Shout out to the Child and Family. We hope everybody's been having a wonderful day and everybody's been enjoying their Sabbath day. I'm your brother, Zachwa, and it's your brother, Kathafo, and we are Hebrew Readers Church. We thank everybody. Um, our, we thank everybody from anyone who just comes and, and passes through our lessons. Uh, we thank you for, for even viewing our lessons. We thank all our members and our supporters. Um, you guys are awesome. We, we praise Ohio for you guys. Um, we, we definitely wanted to give that shout out to everybody for all, everybody putting their hand to the work and laboring. And may Allah Hayyam give every man according to his work. Um, without further ado, we do have a great lesson today. The rudiments of the world of birthdays lawful. Um, we, we were touching on a couple of different topics. And we hope everybody just enjoys it for the sake of doctrine, and for the sake of walking in the spirit of Allah Hayyam and, and Meshach Yache. Um, Brother Kostafo, got anything before we get going? Uh, yes. Um... Thank you all for your prayers for us and uh, shout out to the members for their input and help in the work. And also we want to give a virtual round of applause to Brother Zakwa for the oh, no. um, his work and the quality of the audio and the video. Uh, really appreciate it. Makes everything look nice. And hope it's You're helpful. welcome, Brother Casa Paul. Hi, it's good. All right. On to the juicy stuff. <laughs> we are admonished not to learn the way of the heathen. So searching the scriptures can help understand whether birthdays and the rudiments of the world are different festivals of the world are for those of the Christian faith. Can you read Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, please? Hear ye the word which I have spake unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Ahiah, learn not the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. The signs of heaven is the root of zodiac and birth sign practices or worship. As we know, these are evil practices of practicing being horoscopists so or getting involved in horoscopes from the last lesson. Can you read verse 3, please? For the customs of the people are vain, but one cut up the tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the worksmen with the axe. The customs of the Gentiles are vanity because it stems from idols they are under, whose doctrines are vanity. Can you read Psalm 96, verse 5, please? For all the Alahayams of the nations are idols, but Ahiah made the heavens. All right. So see scripture, the I, the nations and their doctrines that come from the deities they worship are idols, and those idols actually have doctrines. Can you read Jeremiah ch chapter 10, verse 8, please? But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Ahaya sets spirits of authority over the nations to lead them astray. Hence, those who believe in Yache of any nation have to stand aloof from the ways of the heathen and keep the ways of Ahaya, Alahayim, as Christians and children of Abraham by faith and through faith. Can you read Sirach chapter 17, verse 17, please? For in the division of the nations of the whole earth, he said, a ruler over every people. But Israel is the highest portion. So there you see scriptural confirmation again that there are rulers set over every nation. Can you read Jubilee chapter 15, verse 30 and 31, so we can get more understanding of these rulers, please? And he sanctified it and gathered it from amongst all the children of men. For there are many nations and many peoples, and all are his. And over all has he placed spirits and authority to lead them astray from him. But over Israel he did not appoint any angel or spirit, for he alone is their ruler. And he would preserve them and require them at the hand of his angels and his spirits, and at the hand of all his powers, in order that he may preserve them and bless them, and that they may be his, and he may be theirs from henceforth forever. Now, did you notice all nations are his? So he is not the Allahim of the Jews only. He's also the Allahim of the Gentiles. So understanding that Israel is his portion, hence to them are committed the services and the oracles of Allah Hayyam, it doesn't mean that other nations, the brethren among the Gentiles are not his as well and are not welcome to partake 
in the faith of Christ Yache. Scriptures confirm these spirits of authorities are worshipped like we covered in the lesson on horoscopes, how zodiacs are the worship of devils. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, please? Verse 20 to 22, sorry. That's all right. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to Elohim. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the, and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Partaking in the feasts and practices of the Gentiles that come from the idols, doctrines, and practices are provoking the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 10, if we would have read the rest of that portion there, it said that they cut the trees down and they dressed them up in gold and silver. This is the ancient practice like you see with Christmas celebrations today where the trees are decked with ornaments to understand that the things that are happening are worship of idols from ancient times. The doctrine of these idols were first forced upon the Hebrews during the Greek Empire to which some consented. Can you read First Maccabees chapter 41 through 47, please? Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people, and everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion, and sacrificed unto idols, and profaned the Sabbath. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, that they should follow the strange laws of the land, and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice, and drink offerings in the temple, and that they should profane the Sabbath and festival days, and pollute the sanctuary and holy people. Set up altars and groves and chapels of idols, and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts. A key indication of idolatrous practices are the sacrifices eaten of unclean animals according to the law, like swine, which, which can commonly be found in worldly festivals. And as you may have noticed, in order to get one, in order to get the Hebrews to go in one consent with the nations, they had to forsake the laws, commandments, and the feasts and festivals and the things that Allah Hayim commanded to help understand what condition the world is in today, being taken away from Allah Hayim. Thankfully, not everyone conformed. Others, by threats of death, were made to conform to the manners of the Gentiles, which included birthday celebrations, as is evident by Antiochus' birthday sacrifices that he constrained the Israelites to eat of. Can you read 2 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 7? Through nine, please. And in the day of the king's birth, every month they were brought by bitter constraint to eat of the sacrifices. Moreover, there went out a decree to the neighbor cities of the heathen by the suggestion of Ptolemy against the Jews that they should observe the same fashions and be partakers of their sacrifices. And whoso would not conform themselves to the manner of the Gentiles should be put to death. Then might a man have seen the present misery. Believers were once killed for keeping the law and not partaking in the manner of the Gentiles. We have been deceived of all time to think it's a harmless thing to be as the unbelievers. Can you read Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 32, please? And that which cometh into your mind shall not be at all, that ye say. We will be as the heathen, as the families of the countries to serve wood and stone. Hopefully this helps understand partaking in the practices and the worldly customs are also being ones that serve wood and stone. We can serve graven images not only by literally bowing down and worshiping statues, but also walking according to their doctrines. Sadly, seeing the case we are in is no surprise since we thought this way in the past. We were commanded not to do after the doings of Egypt and Canaan, nor to walk in their ordinances. Can you read Leviticus 18 and 3, please? After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwell, you shall not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. 
Genesis chapter 40 and 20 shows the Egyptians celebrated birthdays. So we are not to follow after their doings. Can you read that verse, please? In Genesis 40 and 20. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants. And there we see a birthday party in the scripture being done among the nations. And therefore, it lets us know it's something we are not to follow after. You can read the definition of birthday at H3117. We, it's important to know that word because that word is also going to be used in reference to the Israelites to know we were also celebrating birthdays in unrighteousness when we were gone off. The unbelieving Israelites went off into iniquity and started celebrating birthdays as well, which is considered wickedness in the eyes of Ahiah because he told us not to do after the manner of Egypt and Canaan. Can you read Hosea chapter 7, verse 2, 3, and 5, please? And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. They made the king glad with their wickedness, and the princes with their lies. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hand with scorners. Now notice, these, this is the wickedness that Ahia remembers that beset us. And these things that we were doing in this wickedness of having a having a, a wine festival or having a birthday party where we getting people drunk on their birthdays, which is common today. This is what we're doing of old time to our kings and princes, giving them all the glory and all the attention. And that's how I said in verse three, we were making our kings glad with our wickedness. Because as even today, people relish their birthdays because the day is all about them. Right. And the same thing we were doing to the kings in ancient time. On the king's birthday, they would get him drunk for his birthday, just as is common in world culture today. We find also the heathen continuing to celebrate birthdays in scripture. Herod, the Tetra, the governor of Judah, he was not an Israelite, and he was governor in the days of Yahche. He was celebrating birthdays as well. Can you read Matthew 14 and 6, please? Can I just um, focus on something real quick? Absolutely. Uh, just in case somebody missed it, um, Genesis 40 and 20, when it talks about Pharaoh's birthday, the Hebrew word is H3117. And when you go to um, Hosea chapter 7, verse 5, the when it says, in the day of our king, it's the, the in the day is H3117, which is the same as birthday so that everybody can understand thank you that was important he had a wine party for his birthday All right matthew chapter 14 verse 6 yes. but when he but when herod's birthday was kept the daughter of herodias danced before them and pleased herod so that we see was still practiced among the gentiles or oh, unbelievers, I'll say, because it's something, it's an unbeliever's practice. It's not just a Gentile practice. The righteous saints of the scriptures, like Jeremiah the Hebrew and Job the Gentile, did not hold their birthdays as in any high regard, and excuse me, wow, sorry, in any high regard, unlike the unrighteous who hold feasts and drinking parties for theirs. Can you read Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 14, please? Curse be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. And Job, a Gentile of the children of Keturah, Abraham's third wife, was righteous and a perfect man who hated evil. His testimony shows the value the righteous have for the day of their birth. Job chapter 1, verse 1, and then chapter 3, verse 1, 2, 4, please. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared Elohim and eschewed evil. Job chapter 3, verse 1. After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, 
there is a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness, let not Elohim regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. So there was no glory in birthdays. This is why you find in scripture all the righteous, they, there was no mention of it. People didn't know their age because they kept track of their age, but they didn't make anything of it, walking in humility before Allah. Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of Syria, forced the Jews to partake in birthday sacrifices and other unrighteous celebrations, like the Feast of Bacchus, which is the modern day Bacchanal or carnival with threats of death. So you can also understand that other rudiments of the world, not just birthdays, not just the dressing up of the tree with gold and silver ornaments, which you find in Christmas practices, but other things like carnival also stem from the doctrines of the idols of the nations. Can you read 2 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 7, please? In the day of the king's birth, every month they were brought by bitter constraint to eat of the sacrifices. And when the feast of Bacchus was kept, the Jews were compelled to go in procession to Bacchus carrying ivy. That when they went in procession, you'll find that still today being done during Bacchanal and Carnival where people are riding behind the, the um, caravan of music going in procession just as they did in the ancient times. Believers were forced to partake in birthday celebrations, but the righteous died or fled to the wilderness rather than take in, than partake in the practices of unbelievers. We have been demoralized from the true worship of Allah and the whole world relishes the celebration of their birth and among other things, not understanding that it's to their own hurt. We ourselves come from this as Paul talked about in uh, I think is Ephesians, how we're being changed in our minds from wicked works and we have mercy towards those and compassion knowing that we also are led astray by dumb idols as he admonished Titus about in uh, Titus chapter two. So this is for edification, not in a means to look down on others. Here in the end of the world, people will be tempted to partake in the sacrifices of idols. And if they be unable to resist this, it will cost them their lives. Can you read 2 Ezra chapter 16, verse 68 and 69, please? But behold, the burning wrath of a great multitude is kindled over you. And they shall take away certain of you and feed you, being idle, with things offered unto idols. And they that consent unto them shall be had in derision and in reproach and trodden underfoot. So, praise I have for this understanding now, so that we can know these things are things we have to avoid and not give into, lest we be had in reproach in the times to come. I want to find that scripture as well. So, in going into this, there are those, we all know, just about everybody's partook in the practice of the world coming from our former lives and in our interactions with those who may not know or this may be new information to them there's a way we are to interact with those because we are to be examples of believers i'm gonna read this real quick zach if you don't mind out of titus go ahead brother. please titus chapter 3 verse 2 says speak evil of no man to be no brawler but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful, hating one another. But after the kindness and love of Allah our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we know we're being given this opportunity to attain unto salvation by Allah and mercy. And we have to endure and seek our own salvation with faith and trembling. Hence, we have to be merciful toward all men and continue striving ourselves, not counting ourselves as if we've already made it, but working in hopes that his grace not be in vain in us and that we attain unto the goal of Christ. All right. Thank you. Now, the holy records do not show any birthday celebrations for the worshipers of Ahayah Lahayim. 
Knowing the nations are walking in the doctrines of idols, we can understand that the worldly celebrations like birthdays are rudiments of the world, not like the feast of Alahayim, which are kept in the heavens. And if you hadn't had the opportunity to review those lessons on Ahaya's holy feast days, there's a whole playlist on it. And you can get edification that the feasts that Ahaya ordained are literally kept by the angels in the heaven as well. So it's not a worldly practice. It's something that connects us with the Alahayim. Let's read Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, please. As we have therefore received Christ Yahweh the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Notice that as you have been taught, the people were taught by the hearing of faith, not the works of the law, so people don't need the animal sacrifices for justification. Can you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 2, please? This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? The people didn't receive the Spirit by animal sacrifice. But when the hearing of faith in Christ's sacrifice was preached, they received it. Can you read Acts chapter 10, verse 44 and 45, please? While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them that heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as come with Peter, excuse, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. There you see a simple dichotomy of what Paul asked in Galatians. You see the people receive the Spirit through hearing of faith, right? But when you read um when you read Exodus chapter 24, when Moses sprinkled the blood on the people. Nobody received the spirit off of that. <laughs> so you can see the simplicity of it, right? The people were also taught by the epistles of the apostles too. Can you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, please? Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So we have to remember what we've been taught by word or epistle. They were taught by the apostles to keep the feast as well, which we know are heavenly feasts, not rudiments of the world. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, please? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So it is our tradition as Christians from the words and epistles given unto us to keep the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We do the feast genuinely That's and right. we walk in the fruits of the spirit, not defiling the feast days. There were people coming in with heresies in the church and they would tell the gentiles that came into the faith that were uncircumcised that they had to be circumcised in order to be saved now this was something they were saying to the adults that they had to get up circumcised as adults in order to be saved and let's read acts chapter 15 verse 1 to 2 please a certain man which came down from judea taught the brethren and said Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Notice, this created a big dissension and disputation to tell an adult person that they needed to be circumcised in order to be saved of the Gentiles. Let's see what the answer was about this question. Can you read Acts chapter 15, verse 23 to 24, please? And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the church of the, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia. I'm excuse me, Sicilia. Wherefore as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Notice, this is speaking to the brethren of the Gentiles. They were not given any commandment that they needed to be circumcised. 
nor were they given in commandment that they needed to keep the law of animal sacrifice. Let's see what was good for the Gentiles. Can you read Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and 29, please? For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye you shall do well, fare ye well. There was no need to add the fact that they should keep the commandments because Moses was being read every Sabbath. Can you read Acts chapter 15, verse 21, please? For most of the old time hath in every city them that preaching, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Thank you, brother. So you can understand why the letter was so simple, because they didn't need to go into major detail. They just had to give them focal points, all right? They didn't need to be circumcised as adults because they received the spirit through the hearing of faith, not circumcision in the flesh. And let's touch on Paul covering that. Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, please. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Paul was telling them, how do you think you getting circumcised is going to make you perfect when you begun in the spirit through the hearing of faith? The children of Israel must just circumcise their children on the eighth day as commanded once they come into the faith and understanding. The Gentiles weren't given such commandment by the apostles on the other hand. For both Jews and Gentiles, the true circumcision is that of the heart unto obedience. Can you read Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, please? For whom also are you circumcised with the circumcision made without hands? and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of Elohim, who hath raised him up from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, have been quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, to get out of the way, nailing it to his cross. It's through repentance that he nailed the carnality of man subject to sin unto the cross, according to the Acts of Peter, to unite us and keep us cleaved unto the word of the Lord, so that we may be saved. Continue in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, please. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Knowing that it's Christ's sacrifice, that atoning blood that actually renewed us and brought us back onto Elohim, and it's his nail of repentance that keeps us cleaved unto the word of Elohim. No man can judge us in meat and drink. Meat and drink is referring to animal sacrifices. You don't have to do the sacrifices that pertain to the holy days and the new moons and the Sabbath days because we, as the body, we are part of the sacrifices of Christ, which is the communion that we do in the faith after we're baptized. The animal sacrifices aren't going to bring us unto the kingdom, but the sacrifices of work and righteousness and the fruits of the spirit is of the kingdom. Can you read it? Romans chapter 14, verse 17, please. Uh, I know we're moving on. I just wanted to, to get clarity on something. Because it, sure. wasn't, it wasn't spoken very clearly. Um, the Gentiles, when they come into the faith, um, they don't need to be circumcised because they heard it through the hearing of faith. Right? Yes. All right. As for the Gentiles' children, because the law was given unto Israel, do the Gentile children, after coming into the faith, need to be circumcised? The only people of the Gentiles that had ever been given commandment to circumcise the children was Abraham told Ishmael, his, the sons of Keturah, which are the Arabs, and Esau, who was sitting there, which are what we know as Caucasians today. They were told by Abraham to circumcise their children. And, of course, the children of Israel. But 
it seemed good to the Holy Spirit after that time that the Gentiles be given no such commandments. So they are not obligated to circumcise their children. There you go. Unlike the children of Israel. All right. Is that well, clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm making sure that everybody understands. Oh, I oh, appreciate it. Thanks. Because I'm... Yeah. I'm with stammering lips on another tongue today, man. I can't speak. That's all right, man. I'm just clarifying things so that people can understand what we what was being said. Thank you, brother. Um, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of Elohim is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There you see. The kingdom of Elohim isn't about animal sacrifices. It's about being a living sacrifice, working the fruits of the Spirit. Knowing these facts, we ought to beware lest anyone spoil us through vain philosophy. Can you read Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, please? Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now, Paul is covering a broader spectrum than the topic of animal sacrifice here or the feast days, because those aren't traditions of men. <laughs> right. This it was given by the ministration of angels on Mount Sinai, and the feasts aren't rudiments of the world, because they're also kept in the heavens. So now we get understanding that Paul is talking about something different. He is here referencing the customs of the heathen that we are to avoid, lest we be spoiled by their vain philosophies. You can confirm he's referring to the customs of the heathen because the heathen are under the authority of other angels, not Christ. And those angels have doctrines of their own and their own feasts. And Paul wants us to avoid them. Can you read Colossians chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, please? Let no man beguile you of your reward in, an, in a voluntary humility and worshiping of, of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The worshiping of angels comes from partaking in the rudiments of the world to keep their feasts and sacrifices. Continue, please. And not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of Elohim. When we do these things, we are not holding the head which is Christ in honor. So you can see the difference partaking in the rudiments of the world in the voluntary worshiping of angels, that takes us away from upholding the head, our Lord Christ Yache. Some practices that come from these angels' vain doctrines are Lent. You know the practice of Lent where they fast for about 40 days, which originates from the worship of Tammuz in Ezekiel chapter eight, verse 14. You can Google the origins of these practices to confirm it. Can you read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, please? You want 1 Timothy chapter 4? I do. I just realized okay. what I said. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 3 to 5, please. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Forbidden to marry and commanded to abstain from meats which Elohim hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. But every creature of Elohim is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of Elohim and prayer. This is important. All creatures sanctified by the word of Elohim in his law and prayer over it is to be received with thanksgiving. Unclean meats aren't sanctified by the word, so no prayer could make them worthy of being received with thanksgiving. We are supposed to be holy as he is holy, which requires not defiling our souls with these things. Can you read Leviticus chapter 20, verse 25 and 26, please? You shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean. And you shall not make your souls abominable by beasts or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy unto me, for I am a higher. For I, for I, Ahia, am holy, and have severed you from other people, that you should be mine. But now, brethren of any nation, you hear what Ahia requires of us all. 
the apostles continue to teach us to be holy in this manner as I am holy. Can you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, please? But as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So you can see from what the apostles taught and the traditions that they gave us, they didn't want us partaking in the rudiments of the world. They wanted us to keep the feast in sincerity and truth. And they wanted us to be holy, separating ourselves also, keeping our souls clean by obeying the dietary law. And of course, keeping the commandments. Those dead in Christ don't partake in the rudiments of the world. Can you read Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 to 22, please? Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, if though living in the world, ye are subject to ordinances? Are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Now he's speaking to Christians. If we're dead in Christ as Christians from the rudiments of the world. Why are we partaking in their ordinances? Notice, these are all the commandments and doctrines of men, not the commandments of Allah Hayyam, that were given in the law by the ministration of angels into the hand of the lawgiver. If you look at what he said, touch not, taste not, handle not, no scripture in Allah says those things because Paul isn't talking about not being subject to the ordinances of the law. He is referring to the ordinances created by men. men of the world. Can you read Colossians chapter 2, verse 23, please? Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Some of the things created by the doctrines of men seem wise in fasting and etc., like the Lent practice, but they aren't of the Lord and his spiritual things. And that's why Paul also said they're, all, they're going to perish with the using in Colossians 2 and 22. Can you continue reading Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, please? Mm -hmm. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of al -Hayim. Set Set your affection on things above, not on things upon the earth. Now, this gives us perspective. Now we're Christians. We're in the faith of Christ, being buried with him in baptism. We're risen with him to a new life. So now our mindset should be on the things that are above, the spiritual things, the heavenly feasts, not the rudiments of the world that we came from. What are these heavenly things we're to seek after as Christians? The laws and the, and the feasts of spiritual things from above that are for us to seek after. Can you read Romans chapter 7, verse 12 and 14, please? Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now, this is why we need to follow the Spirit, not our flesh, to be subject to the law. Because if we walk in our carnality, we're going to be subject to sin. Can you... Read Romans chapter 8, verse 6 and 7, please. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against Elohim, for, for it is not subject to the law of Elohim, neither indeed can be. To be carnal kills us because we can't be subject to the law when we are walking in that way. Can you read Romans chapter 8, verse 8, please? So then they that are in the flesh cannot please Allah. Galatians 5 and 16. Then I say then, this I say then, walk in the spirit that ye shall not be, excuse me, walk in the spirit that ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There we see, if we're walking in the spirit, we're going to be doing according to the laws and commandments and the ordinances that are good, walking according to the traditions that we've been taught from the apostles and the admonitions in their epistles, keeping the feast without leaven in sincerity and truth. 
and not walking in the rudiments of the world to the voluntary worship of angels. Now, the celebration the believers had in scripture, they had banquets and thanksgiving when children were weaned. So if you have a family get together because you're about to have a child and they want to give gifts in preparation for the child and to help the family, there's nothing wrong with that. Just have to be mindful not to be worshiping the person, but giving thanks to Allah Hayyam for the mercy of conceiving seed and in hopes that the seed make it healthily. And then having things even when the child is healthy, there's nothing wrong with that as we see as Abraham did. Now, we know birthdays are the worship of the person. You'll find in the book of Luke, the people came from another country to pay homage unto Christ the day he was born and to give him gifts. This was righteous to do because Christ is the Lord himself. He is to be worshipped. In the ascension of Isaiah, he's worshipped in the seventh heaven. And also in the earth, when you read the gospel, you see people falling down and worshipping before his feet, men and demons alike, to know that it is righteous to worship the Lord Yahweh. So the men that came and paid homage to him and gave him gifts, they did what was fitting to do unto our Lord, because Allah am wills that he be glorified above all. But to worship other men, to have birthday celebrations and homage to them would be unrighteous because the righteous didn't do such things. They also had feasts of thanksgiving unto Allah for deliverance. They had wedding feasts, burial ceremonies, and Ahaya's holy days, which you can view the playlist on Ahaya's holy days to get an understanding of all the different feasts that he established. Let's get an example of the banquet when a child is weaned. Abraham made a banquet on the day of his son being weaned, not the celebration of the day of his birth. It was a miracle to the inhabitants of the land due to Abraham and Sarah's age, and all the people came to the feast and rejoiced with them at the news that a son had been given. Can you read Genesis chapter 21, verse 8, please? And Isaac grew, excuse me, and the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Notice it wasn't about his birth, it was the day he was weaned. He was thankful that the child was healthy. Can you read Jasset chapter 21, verse 5 to 8, please? And Shem and Eber and all the great people of the land, and, and Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and his servants, and Phicol, the captain of his host, came to eat and drank and rejoiced at the feast which Abraham made upon the day of his son Isaac being weaned. Also Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, his brother, came from Haran, they and all belonging to them, for they greatly rejoiced on hearing that a son had been born to Sarah. And they came to Abraham, and they ate and drank at the feast which Abraham made upon the day of Isaac's being weaned. And Terah and Nahor rejoiced with Abraham, and they remained with him many days in the land of the Philistines. But there you see, it wasn't about his birthday, nor did he have a feast every year. It was just Thanksgiving for that moment. Just like people would get together because they find out you know, you're having a baby. It's for that moment. It's not a continual thing. All right. Feasts of Thanksgiving for deliverance are also good to do. Not, there's nothing wrong with it. The man made a feast in Thanksgiving for his son being returned home unto him. Can you read Luke chapter 15, verse 21 to 24, please? Mm -hmm. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So then you see, he was thankful for Allah and delivering his child, and he had a feast. So that's something to be thankful for. Say you get a job that you've been trying to get, and you, the day you find out the news, you get it. You call up your friends, and y'all go out to eat or have a good time in Thanksgiving for Allah and mercy. There's nothing wrong with that. All right? Wedding feasts last usually 7 to 14 days. Can you read Genesis chapter 29, verse 21 and 22, please? And Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. 
And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And you can see how long the feast usually lasts. Can you read Tobit chapter 11, verse 19? And Tobiah's wedding was kept seven days with great joy. All right. And also you can do it for 14 days. Can you do can you read Tobit chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, please? For before the day that the marriage were finished, Rachiel had said unto him by an oath that he should not depart till the 14th day of the marriage were expired. All right. So you see, you can also have the wedding for 14 days. And there was also the burial ceremony of mourning for seven days for the dead. Can you read the book of Adam and Eve, chapter 51, please? When they had been mourning four days, then Michael and the archangel appeared and said to Seth, Man of Elohim, mourn not for thy dead more than six days. For on the seventh day is the sign of the resurrection and the rest of the age to come. On the seventh day, I had arrested from all his works. Thereupon Seth made the tables. And this is confirmed practice in scriptures as well. When you look at Sirach chapter 22, verse 12, please. Seven days do men mourn for him that is dead, but for a fool and an unholy man all the days of his life. All right. You can reference other scriptures like Sirach 38 and 16 and Jasher chapter 24, verse 12 to 16 to see the burial practices. Now, some world history on birthday worship. We have the scriptural understanding and we can see through scriptures. Birthday celebration is not something for us to do because it's a custom of the heathen and rudiment of the world. All right. From, there's a website link. Please visit the website, hebrewreaders.com and go to Doctrine Video Notes. And you can get the links from where we're about to read from, okay? This is from the Satanic Bible. This is an excerpt from it. It says, the highest of all holidays in the Satanic religion is the date of one's own birthday. This is in direct contradiction to the holy of holy days of other religions, which deify a particular deity who has been created in an anthropomorphic form of their own image, thereby showing that the ego is not really buried. The Satanists feel, why not really be honest? And if you are going to create a deity in your image, why not create that deity as yourself? Every man is a deity if he chooses to recognize himself as one. So the Satanists celebrate his own birthday as the most important holiday of the year. After all, aren't you happier about the fact that you were born than you are about the birth of someone you have never even met? Or, for that matter, aside from religious holidays, why pay higher tribute to the birthday of a president or to a date in history than we do to the day we were brought into this greatest of all worlds. Despite the fact that some of us may not have been wanted, or at least were not particularly planned, we're glad, even if no one else is, that we are here. You should give yourself a pat on the back, buy yourself whatever you want, treat yourself like the king or deity that you are, and generally celebrate your birthday with as much pomp and ceremony as possible. That's the view of the Satanists. And you can get the website link for the source of that info. Now, this is another link and um, perspective on birthdays. It's interesting that birthdays are considered the most, important, in, the most important holiday to these Satan worshipers. The founding of their church called Walpurgisnack and Halloween are the other ones of importance to them. Of course, early Christians did not celebrate birthdays, nor did the early Jews, nor have real Christians ever celebrated Halloween. From this article, it says, Oregon of Alexandria, writing over two centuries after the death of Yace, follows this same line when he recorded a diatribe against the memories of birthdays, indicating that at the time of his writing, a day to remember the birth of Yace was not a part of the church calendar. In his homilies on Leviticus, speaking on the aspect of birth, Oregon states, Not one from all the saints is found to have celebrated a festive day or a great feast on the day of his birth. 
No one is found to have had joy on the day of the birth of his son or daughter. Only sinners rejoice over this kind of birthday. For indeed, we find in the Old Testament, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, celebrating the day of his birth with a festival, and in the New Testament, Herod. However, both of them stained the festival of his birth by shedding human blood. But the saints not only do not but the saints not only do not celebrate a festival on their birthdays, but filled with the Holy Spirit, they curse that day after the example of Job, Jeremiah, and David. All right. This is also another excerpt. What is the origin of birthday celebrations? Birthday celebrations are actually rooted in paganism. This is from the Encyclopedia America in 1991. It states, the ancient world of Egypt, Greece, Rome, and Persia celebrated the birthdays of deities, kings, and nobles. Authors Ralph and Adeline Linton reveal the underlying reason for this. In their book, The Law of Birthdays, they write, Mesopotamia and Egypt, the craters of civilization, were also the first lands in which men remembered and honored their birthdays. The keeping of birthday record was important in ancient times, principally because a birthday was essential for the casting of a horoscope. Look at that, why they kept track of the birthday for casting horoscopes, which we know are the worship of the zodiacs. So there's a direct connection between the pagan practice of birthday celebrations and astrology, horoscopes, and fortune telling. Not surprisingly then, the ancient Jews did not celebrate birthdays regarding them as pagan. Also the World Book Encyclopedia, chapter three, verse 416 states, the early Christians did not celebrate his, speaking of Christ's birthday because they considered the celebration of anyone's birth to be a pagan custom. Down to the fourth century, Christianity rejected the birthday celebration as a pagan custom. To satiate this point, notice also the record of the first century historian Josephus. The Jews in Christ's day knew Elohim's attitude toward birthday celebration. Nay, indeed, the law does not permit us to make festivals at the births of our children. This is from Josephus against Appion in Book 2, paragraph 26, it looks like. So, and so you see, our law does not permit us to make festivals at the births of our children. And you can confirm this to be true because nowhere in scripture does somebody have a festival when their child was born. Abraham celebrated his child being weaned, which he was thankful because the child was healthy, but he didn't have a festival at his actual birth. Yache being worshipped throughout his life and at his birth is what was fitting because he is the Lord and Allah Hayyam. But he didn't have a feast for the day he was born, nor did anyone hold a festival for the day of his birth after that. Worshipping him is right and good because he's even worshipped in the heavens, but no one worshipped his birthday, nor are we to worship our own birthdays. We cannot serve two masses. Now, this is me speaking. <laughs> okay, we're done with the excerpts. <laughs> we cannot serve two masses. We cannot partake in the celebrations of the world, like birthdays and etc. and still serve Allah Hayyam. There is no concord between Yache and Belie. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 to 21, please? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to Allah Hayyam. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Can you read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, please? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. All right. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, please? Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. In closing, we hope this helps understand that birthday practices and the rudiments of the world. Uh, the celebrations like Christmas, Thanksgiving, Halloween, and etc. are unseemly practices for believers in Christ Yache as Christians. May Ahayat deliver us all by his power and mercy through Yache Christ from all idolatry.
Now, in regards to birthday celebrations, if people celebrate it, remember, we have to be at peace with all men while walking in wisdom with them and don't have, I'm sorry, we have to be at peace with all men walking with them in wisdom that among those that don't have the same faith. If someone calls you for your birth, for what they consider to be your birthday, just politely say, oh, I don't celebrate it anymore. But how are you? I'm glad to hear from you. And change the subject. If it isn't the first time you inform that person about your preference and they continue to try to talk to you about it or call you about birthdays, just ignore the birthday comment and say, hey, how's it going? And change the subject because just move on is not something you have to repeat. And nor are we to be grieved with what someone else is doing because we're walking in singleness of soul. Just talk to them like nothing going on, giving no heed to the birthday part. Similar to when a person may bless you in the name of an idol, like you, you may have a person tell you, God bless you. You can just ignore the comment and talk as if nothing happened. Knowing an idol is nothing and say, have a nice day or be safe out there. Knowing we don't agree while maintaining peace with the person. It would not, would not be wise to say thank you or the same to you, lest we be in consent unto the idol receiving a blessing from an idol or also partaking in the birthday worship or birthday practice by when somebody calls you to say thanks when they tell you happy birthday. If people are celebrating a birthday, say there's a party coming up or an event, just don't attend nor eat the sacrifice, which is the food and continue like nothing is wrong. And Lord willing, the person may wonder why you never attend anymore and inquire of the change. Then just in fear and meekness, tell them it's a change in my faith and a change in my lifestyle. If they are interested, if they're interested and want to know more, just send them the video to give them the chance to search it out for themselves in their own time and make sure you pray for them. That Allah may open their heart to it. Let's because we don't want to just say too much and then we cast a pearl onto an unready heart or pour too much water on a seed and that's not ready to grow. Be harmless as a dove and wise as a serpent. Don't go making a scene or blowing things up out of proportion unless you bring a reproach upon yourself. Also, don't cast pearls onto folks that aren't ready to hear lest you get a block and turn them away by not waiting for the right time to speak in due season. Hopefully this helps. Brother Zachbar, anything? Uh, I always keep in mind uh, that a lot of times when people, although they're not walking in the right spirit or, you know, whatever's leading them might not be the right thing, but they actually took the time out to say something to you or to be nice. So don't tear them down just because they're, they're not accurate or they're not at the same level or, or they're not as far progressed as you as, as it become of your faith. We have to be in love at all times and, and show them love. So really trying to keep it simplistic is the key. Uh, if somebody tells you happy birthday, you know, hey, I don't separate birthdays. Thank you for the love. Like, Thanks for the love. You actually took the time out of your day to, to write me a message or to say something to me. And for that, you need to be thankful that they actually are actually are trying to, to show you some love and, and actually are thinking about you, which is great. It's just it's not channeled the right way. So you just have to kind of fix it a little bit and still be grateful. So. Allah, I am willing, you know, uh, ho hopefully that works for you. All right. Thank you, brother. No problem. And let's pray out. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
See you all. All right, well, and we'll see you guys there for the next lesson. What the file of the temple. <laughs> Challenge. Challenge.